morning. Um, so welcome. Um, my name is Ruth Bailey. Um, I'm a non-executive member of the board and will be chairing today's meeting. I'd like to welcome everybody to our second meeting of the South West London Integrated Care Board. Can I remind everyone that the meeting is being broadcast online and recorded. The recording will be uploaded onto the ICB website after the meeting and British Sign Language will be available on the website. Can members remember to use your microphones? It's probably the thing that will trip me up. Um, when you speak for the benefit of people at the meeting as well as the recording. A hearing loop is available should anyone need access to it. Can I remind everyone that this is a meeting which is being held in public but not a public meeting? We're not expecting any fire alarm tests today, so if the alarm does sound, we will all need to leave the room through the emergency exits marked in the room or through the main reception and assemble in the fire assembly point, which is the grassed area at the end of the car park marked with green signs. We will all do our best to avoid jargon and acronyms, but a glossary of terms is available on the ICB website and included on chairs for members of the public observing the meeting today. Questions from the, mem from the members of the public will be taken at the end of the meeting. In terms of apology, we've received apologies from Martin Spencer, non-executive member, Dame Kelly Palmer, partner member for specialised services, Joe Farrar, partner member for community services, Nicola Jones, partner member for primary medical services, Ian Dodds, place member for Richmond, Annette Poults, place member for Kingston, and Mark Krillman, place member for Wandsworth. And then we have two people who will need to leave us at 12.15, Matthew Kershaw and Ruth Dombey. And so with no further apologies, the meeting is corporate. Moving on to item two, declaration of interests. You should all have a copy of the declared interests in your pack of papers. Could I ask members to declare any additional interest not on the agenda, um, not, not already on the register, and uh, any interests arising from the agenda or papers presented for the meeting today? Uh, Ruth, can I just uh, raise the fact that I'm a member, uh, non-executive director of the, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Um, there's no clash with anything on the agenda. Thank you, Mercy. Thank you. So, item three, minutes, action log and matters arising. So these are the minutes and action arising from the ICB meeting held on the 1st of July 2022. Um, the minutes of the previous meeting are included for approval. Does everyone agree that they are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Thank you. I understand all the actions on the action log are closed except for one relating to Children and Young People Board in SWL. Gloria, can you give us a brief update on the action relating to the development of Children and Young People's Board in SWL? Thank you, Ruth. Um, we have start, we started the board just before um, before we became ICS about around May time this year, and is co-chaired by a director of children services and myself. So again, in preparation to become an ICS and to integrate um, strongly, we are going from strength to strength, and we have schools. It's, it's sort of like represent the whole population. Our there are five key things that we are focusing on. One is looking at complex and um, complex care need for children, and also we are looking at send and transition. Those are our key priorities. Also, in terms of physical health, we are looking at asthma, which is part of that London and regional priorities. And I think um, finally we are looking at parenting. Just thinking about using think family scope, not just the children, looking at the whole family as a whole. Thank you. Sorry, that sounds great. Thanks, Gloria. Any further issues? Ruth, uh, just one small point. Uh, item two, um, we've agreed to uh, receive the primary care strategy next March. So the item is closed in the sense that a decision has been made, but probably a good idea to just keep it on the, on the log so we remember come next March. That's great. We will do that indeed. Can that be noted, please? Any other comments on the action log? Great, thank you. 
Um, so, the board approved the minutes. Uh, decisions made in any other meetings. So, a part two meeting of the board was held on the 21st of September 2022. <coughs> part two meetings allow the board to meet without the public to discuss items that may be business sensitive and matters that are confidential in nature. For transparency, the decisions made in other meetings are brought today for the board to note in public. So these are the board approved the allocations of NHS England winter funds against the proposed scheme across South West London for urgent and emergency care. The board approved a request for a tender waiver to extend the current urgent care services model in Croydon for 12 months. To ensure continuity of service across South West London GP practices, the board approved a contract award to Egton. Two contract extensions for IC transition support have been agreed by the ICB CEO and chair of the ICB Finance and Planning Committee following discussion at the ICB board and then finally as part of the process for the consideration of the delegation of pharmacy optometry and dental services from April 2023 in line with other London ICBs the completion of a pre-delegation assessment framework has been agreed to be delegated to Sarah Blow CEO and Mark Creelman, SRO for Primary Care. The delegation process and the decision for the board will be set out at a future board meeting. The board is asked to note the decisions made in other meetings. Is everybody content to do so? Thank you. Item five, Chief Executive Officer's report. Sarah, I'll ask you to now speak to this item. Thank you very much, Chair. So, um, just a few items on my report. One was uh, just to bring to people's attention the BBC Panorama <coughs> report on mental health services, uh, just to give assurance that we are working across our two mental health trusts, South of St George's and SLAM, to look at um, a review of those inpatient services to make sure that we are uh, uh, look, looking after those patients appropriately. Um, there was a letter that came out from Claire Murdoch, who's the National Lead for Mental Health, asking all mental health trusts to do a review. So just, just to let people know that we're, we're looking at that. Secondly, I just thought we would update on the Secretary of State, or the current Secretary of State, I should say, uh, priorities for health and care. Um, which is the ABCD, for those of you that haven't seen that, uh, and that's ambulances, uh, backlogs, uh, care, which is uh, how we work with our local authorities around social care, uh, doctors, but mainly focused on GPs, and dentistry. So those are the kind of ABCDs for the current Secretary of State. Um, chair arrangements, just, just so um, everyone is aware that obviously our previous chair has resigned and stepped down. Uh, Ruth is chairing today. We are in the process now of appointing a new chair. An advert did go out last week, so uh, I'm giving you an update from my report because at the time of writing uh, it hadn't gone out, but it has now gone out to advert. And London Health and Care Partnership, well Dick and I were both an interesting um, event on Tuesday where we went to central London and met with local authority colleagues, uh, colleagues, for, colleagues from the voluntary sector um, and, and other people in the health service to look at integration across London and how we might work together uh, going forwards at a London level. So uh, Dick and I both attended that, it was a very interesting day and I think more work for us to do together across London. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions for Sarah on the back of that update? Thank you. So the board notes the contents of the report. Item six, delegation of specialised commissioning pre-delegation assessment framework. I'm going to ask Jonathan Bates to speak to this item. Jonathan. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, I'm speaking to this uh, item on behalf of Lucy Waters and the uh, specialist uh, commissioning team across South London who are uh, unable uh, to be with us uh, today. Um, so this, this paper, and hopefully colleagues have had an opportunity to re review it, talks about specialised services. Those are, those are complex care uh, pathways for patients. And it sets out how uh, we intend to devolve or delegate 65 of them to the local ICB uh, from NHS England. There's a total of 150. Some will never be delegated because they're such rare conditions. Uh, some are not yet ready for delegation, but a significant number 
uh, are and in terms of financial value they're also significant. And I think this is important for three reasons. It's important for whole pathway care, for end-to-end -end, uh, care pathway uh, treatment for patients. It's important for removing barriers to access, including addressing health inequalities. I'll come on to give examples of those in a moment. And it's actually important to our local providers who sit around this table too, particularly to St George's and to the Royal Marston, um, who have significant flows of specialist care, though all our uh, trusts do to some extent. I think it's also important in noting the pre-delegation assessment framework, which is the process that NHS England is asking us to work our way through at the moment. There is no status quo option, so we cannot stay as we are uh, now. There are two proposals on the table, one about a joint committee arrangement, uh, uh, where we would sit around a table with NHS England in relation to decision making, and one where we would take delegation and responsibility and have a broader role and remit for the care of the local population. The paper sets out six areas, just to mention what they are. So the first is geography, uh, so the bounds of this programme of work and working with colleagues in South East London uh, and how we would set up our joint working relationships as an ICB. It also notes our links into Surrey Heartlands ICB too, given the extensive flows uh, for, for that population. It sets out plans around transformation and if I have a moment or two I'll, I'll mention a couple of those just so um, uh, members of the public and, and members of the board can hear some of the potential gains I think there might be. The third area is governance and this sets out how through the London Partnership Board and through the Strategic Oversight Group that Sarah will sit on and the Executive Management Board that I'll sit on, uh, we'll continue to have oversight uh, and effective governance arrangements in the uh, local system. Uh, through it, set, it sets out our proposals around money, which is obviously a key issue in relation to this uh, uh, plan. Workforce, and in this context, it's largely around delegation of staff associated with specialist commissioning services, of which there are only a handful uh, in London, and a precious uh, resource. Um, and then finally, about data and analytics, because it's more than 10 years actually since these services have been run <coughs> locally. Um, so. We, we need to make sure we have the right data flows to understand and deliver that end-to-end -end care model I described around. In terms of the timeline for this, just so board members are aware, this isn't the end point. Uh, this is a draft submission, this pre-delegation assessment is a draft submission. Uh, it will go in tomorrow to NHS England. We're expecting feedback on the 26th of October and a final version by the 18th of November. That's, that will then go through a national moderation process in December before NHS England make a decision at their board meeting on the 2nd of February next year. So that's the envisaged um, timeline in, uh, in, in relation to this uh, process. So there's an opportunity um, to flex the proposal in response to feedback we received from NHS England and indeed from this uh, board. So, um, just to touch on, if I may, a couple of examples I, I thought that were really pertinent uh, around this. So, um, by joining up end-to-end -end care for things like HIV screening, we've already been able to ensure that patients who arrive in A&E having a, an HIV test, we've been able to identify 95 people uh, so far this year who did not know they had HIV. Uh, and that programme is being extended actually today in uh, some parts of South London, some of trust in South London, to Hep B and Hep C patients. So that's a, that's a really good example. Uh, for sickle cell um, disease where there are major health inequality issues, I think if you have access to those truly specialist services, they're great, but there's plenty of experience and there's um, uh, parliamentary reports actually on those who have not had good access to care, which is disconnected between what's commissioned uh, by our predecessor organisations in primary care, urgent and emergency care, with what the specialist services look like. We could apply the same to the renal pathway, where we can join things up more effectively and do more prevention work at the beginning of the pathway. And there are a number of uh, cardiac conditions. Um, the one that uh, Lucy, who leads on specialist commissioning for us, is, or often talks about is a particular aortic valve procedure, a TAVI, as it's called, where um, the research shows, even though there's no clinical evidence base for this, if you're a black male, you're eight times less likely to have that than a white male in South London. 
So um, there, there's some examples of how we could change care pathways to address health inequalities by greater connectivity around uh, what we do. So, those, so I think there's a real opportunity. Uh, I think there are risks, just to note those, and so the board is, is aware of those, and probably the three that stand out for me are the financial uh, risk in relation to this, and understanding fully uh, what we're inheriting will take a little time. Um, what spend in specialised services pre-pandemic was going up about 7 or 8% a year. The reassuring part I take in this is the, the bit that was going up very fast, which was the high cost drug spend, which was going up something like 27% a year, um, is not being delegated through this process. It's the rest of specialised services that went up at about 1 or 2% in comparison with that rise. But it, it's, uh, it would be uh, disingenuous not to be clear that there are uh, <coughs> further work to understand the data and the risks that sit around uh, the financial aspects of this. There's a, there's a people risk, and this is one of the reasons we're keen to do this in London. There's a small and fragile team, literally a handful of people who are managing these services across London, and we feel that we could do more through the influence of the ICB and the ICS to support that and st to strengthen that across things like finance and BI and quality. Um, but but it's a, it is an issue for people um, to note. Um, and then probably the other issue is any legacy issues that might emerge and that we're working through with NHS England how we might, we might manage that because you can imagine in 65 services coming across with a very small team managing them centrally there are some risks that we might inherit something that we were uh, not necessarily expecting. So there's some real advantages for the population locally. Um, there are a few risks as I've articulated. Um, we will continue to work through this and the request is that um, uh, the authority is divested to, um, to Sarah as the chief executive around signing off the final version of the uh, pre-delegation assessment framework once that's finalised later this year. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, really succinct summary. Could I ask if there are any questions? James. Um, thank you very much for the summary. I suppose my reflection is that if we're being delegated from April 23, which is my understanding, then actually the work starts pretty soon because we need to, to be in a planning round for 23-24, basically acting as if this is being delegated. Um, so as, that leads me on to my question, which is, uh, are we ready to mobilise the structures and processes and resources that are outlined in this so that we're not sort of picking it up very late into the run into 23-24, but we're actually able to integrate it with the rest of our planning timetable for next year? So, so I, I think James, we're as well prepared as anyone is, I think would be my summary. So over the last 18 months or so, we've had a office across South London focused on specialised services and what we intend to do around supporting um, delegation in this space. And this is the sort of uh, goal for what we're trying to achieve. It would be fair to say that we're working through internally, as I said a, a moment ago, what it means for quality, what it means for BI, what it means for finance. Uh, what it means locally. I think we're, we've also tried to build and strengthen our arrangements. So I know there's a, a proposal for a specialised board for South West London, uh, which people around this table would uh, coordinate and, and chair. So I think we have the right arrangements in place. I think we need to do more work to build resilience for them going forward. And it reflects my earlier point about uh, people or few people we will inherit, if any, money and legacy issues are some of the risks in relation to this. So um, there are risks, but are we as well prepared as anywhere else in the country? I think we are. And there are some debates going on about nationally how they might want to support South London, given the good progress that we've put in place to get into a good place to, to deliver this delegation come April. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thanks. So, can I just have a show of hands, please, if we're content uh, to approve the PDAF submission to NHSE London? Thank you. OK, 
Okay, item seven, virtual wards business case. Could I ask Martin to join us? Welcome, Martin. Um, so, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, assuming everyone's had a chance to read the paper, um, just to give a quick summary. Um, last year in the planning guidance, um, each ICS was asked to set up um, virtual wards to support acute flow um, over, uh, particularly over the winter, but over the course of the next two years. By December 23, we're to have 40 to 50 beds per 100,000 set up. Um, we, we already have um, six boroughs covered by local virtual wards, which was set up in December, uh, in, during COVID. Um, and we've developed a model of care across South West London, um, which builds on those local, local virtual wards and puts in place a remote monitoring hub. This is to support people for 24-7 uh, care. Um, over, and that will la enable us to bring people who have high acuity into the community and support flow through acutes. <clears throat> so we aim to have 220 beds in place um, by December, by quarter four this year. Um, and taking that up to 424 beds by December next year. The funding model for that is 4.5 million for 23-24 uh, and 6 million for 20, sorry, for 22-23 and 6 million for 23-24. It has been reduced this year by half a million to fund the pay rise. Um, so you can see a reduction of the original allocation. Um, and from beyond that, this will need to be self-funding. So, so in terms of a model of care, this, we need to be able to demonstrate that this delivers for the system over the course of the next six to 12 months, I think, to make that case for 24 onwards. Um, so this, this model of care uh, and this proposal for allocation has received support across the system. So we've taken it to each place. Um, actually, each place has been instrumental in the development of this and the model of care, um, and, and I think what we've got here is a very innovative model. Um, it's been supported by the APC. Uh, it's also been supported by SMT and the Finance and Performance Group. We had to do a national submission on our plans for virtual wards, and we got praise from the national team on this model of care and our implementation plans. So um, the recommendation is for the board to approve this proposal and for the financial allocations of the virtual ward program. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Martin. Any questions? Ruth. Thank you, and I, and I, I know we all welcome this. We all understand that where appropriate, the best bed for a person to be in who needs support is their own bed. Um, so this makes absolute sense. I'm just worried about the impact, particularly the financial impact, it's going to have on the wider system. So clearly there is a, a drive here to ensure that people don't have to go into hospital unless they absolutely need it or are able to get out quicker. Um, I'm not clear how this is going to help with preventing admissions, but more importantly, what support there is going to be for social care, for the voluntary community sector, who clearly are going to have to be able to step up to ensure this works properly. So I'd just like to understand how the money is going to flow and how that support will be available. So th this model um, that's being funded nationally um, is to support earlier discharge from hospital. Uh, so to reduce the length of stay, and, that's, and, that, and the intention of that is to uh, enable f better flow through acutes. Um, I, what we've got, what we're creating here is a, is a bigger sort of capability that we could uh, certainly look at how we prevent admissions and work with social care, but the funding's directed towards that, that means of, of, re of reducing length of stay in acutes at this point in time. So it, it does not, doesn't fund social care directly. Um, but the, the models of care will be working, uh, the local virtual world, sorry, will be working with local uh, authorities around how packages potentially could support some people who go through this model. But most people will be um, probably those who would be going home in the next few days, but would go home about three days earlier. 
Can I come back to you? So I understand that side of the equation, but then when people are discharged and are at home um, in a virtual ward, there is going to be a greater need within the community for community care, social care um, and support from the voluntary community sector. How's that going to work? So there is there's a significant part of this resource goes to those local virtual wards. So there's, an in, there's a significant increase in community teams to be able to support people in their own home who need hands-on care. I just wonder if I come back on that. I wonder, Martin, if, because I, I think there's an, an assumption that there isn't a, a significant impact on social care. If anything, it'll probably help social care because these, these people may have been funded by social care if they weren't going into a voucher ward. But perhaps as part of the assessment, because we're going to do an 18 month assessment of this, we could pick that up, Ruth. We could assess whether or not we think there is any impact on local authorities, voluntary sector, or others. So we could pick that up as part of the, uh, the assessment. Thank you. Um, Dick. Thanks, Ruth. Um, and just to echo that last point, I'm sure that when we get this, well, you know, let me roll back. This is a wonderful initiative and it seems re really valuable to take forward. Let's, let's hope it works uh, and, and can be uh, scaled up. Firstly, I'm, I'm sure that when we get, if, if scaling up is possible, we do want to look at the finances in the round and actually that's probably a good principle for this board that we should be thinking about the pound we spend on the health of people in southwest london rather than the institution it comes from and and the more that can be built in the better um the thing i wanted to ask about was whether martin you could just give a, a bit of a more sense of scale to help me Im imagine what this pilot uh does i mean um up to 400 beds in, in year two but it looks like it's about a f four beds of virtual addresses, one acute bed. Is that right? And how many acute beds are there in South West London? I'm sure I should know, but I don't. I just want to get a sense of what percentage of, of the system is this, and what percentage might it be if it turns out to be a viable and strong idea? So, so the projections are based around um, an individual, two individuals per month going into a virtual ward bed. So a length of stay on the virtual ward for about 15 days. Um, so I guess calculating that out, you're probably talking about, you know, when we've got up to what's it, 424. So in the region of 850 to 850 people per month going through this. Um, apologies, I don't know how many acute beds there are. I'm sure Jonathan might be able to help with that. Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. So uh, I'm going to answer your question. It's actually in the, in, in the papers, but I, I also wanted to say, just as I got the, the floor, as it were, how important this is for the whole delivery of urgent emergency care for, the, for this winter. Um, it is a key plank of what we're trying to um, put, put in place and have invested in uh, significantly. I was very struck, um, a number of us were at Croydon a, a few weeks ago uh, in response to Ruth's question of just how close working was with local authority and how willing people were to learn talking to frontline people driving this work how it was very much seeing a sort of uh, a learning model and an evolving model over time um, and I'm, I was very pleased to hear we've already got 95 of those beds in, in situ so, so, so it's good progress anyway to answer your question specifically at the risk of being slightly over precise chair but as it's in the papers for the meeting so it says as um, of the summer months it's just over um, 2200 beds it's 2271 is the number in the paper and the proposal is there's 2428 by midwinter being as i say probably slightly overly overly precise but between 2200 and 2500 i think is the answer to your question dick depending on the time of year Thank you, Matthew. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um, so I have uh, the joy of being the SRO uh, for the virtual ward rollout um, across South West London, uh, and I uh, endorse uh, the comment Jonathan just made about the working approach uh, between colleagues um, uh, to try and get this off the ground. Um, uh, in answer to Ruth's question, I thought I'd just add uh, my perspective, because I absolutely understand Ruth's uh, nervousness with this. Um, I think success of virtual ward would be to make sure that there isn't a social care impact on the basis that these are patients who are supposed to be having a shorter acute length of stay. They're not supposed to be patients in the virtual ward who are already at home 
um, getting additional support and neither should they be social care patients or patients who no longer have acute needs, who now need social care needs, going out into the community through a virtual ward pathway. These should be acute patients who currently are in hospital for, let's say, 10 days, who in the future could be in hospital for seven days on their acute pathway. Uh, and that, for me, is success. So I think Sarah's right, we should evaluate it, and you're right to raise the issue, because it is a live concern, and I appreciate it. But success would be actually addressing your issue by ensuring the patients that are in the virtual ward are acute patients going home early. That requires some system and process. It requires some technology to support it, but most importantly, it requires a bit of a culture change in terms of how we manage, as an NHS, those patients. Uh, and that comes down to clinicians being confident and comfortable that the service that they can receive virtually is as safe and appropriate as that that they would get for their patients in an acute hospital bed. So that's the work we're trying to do. So I think you're right to flag but we are very mindful that success of this would be in the way I've described, in which case I think that mitigates largely the concern you have. Um, admittedly, we should review to make sure that's what, what does happen. Jacqueline. Uh, thank you very much and equally um, as welcome. Uh, so really pleased to see there's a central remote monitoring hub. I think that's great. But my main question sort of links into what something Matthew said is, how do we make sure that we standardise and reduce variation across South West London so we don't have six different ways of doing things, which is a potential possibility, or at least four anyway. And the other question was, uh, that I didn't quite understand, is you said, and then it needs to be self-funding. What does that, I don't understand what that means and where we might get the funding from if it's not centrally. Because for me, that means we might have to shut beds, which seems to defeat the object a bit. But I just wonder what self-funding meant for us going forward. So, so the, the two-year funding we have is SDF funding, um, and beyond that we'll need to make the case for how we build this into our baseline costs um, going forward. So, so the, through this two-year period we do need to demonstrate this, that this has a significant impact on the system to be able to do that and make a call probably with it, you know, within the first 12 months around whether it does make a significant impact. <laughs> So we have got documented SOPs for each, working with each local virtual ward. It, the way the local virtual wards are set up do slightly vary at this point in time, but that's okay, I think, because this is the beginning of a journey. We should be, we have got really good um, working collaborative processes. So I think we've got an opportunity to, as this grows, to be able to come together and have a standardised practice where we can demonstrate um, how this works well. So we have a, a monthly uh, CQI process where we, we look at how it's worked last month and get, as a team across South West London, review that and look for improvement. So I suspect that gives us an opportunity to be able to converge on how we, uh, how we have uh, standardised practice. And this, this is a scale model. This lends itself to, to sort of the single way of doing things. But the starting point has been quite different. Each local virtual ward has had a very different model of care. Um, so we, we don't want to trash that. We want to build on that. So, uh, the, so over the course of the next 12 months, we'll have to look at how we do that. Thank you. And I suppose I just wanted just to note that we, there are probably some choices to make then for the ICB, won't there, going forward? Um, and that was really the... Thank you very much. Sarah, if you want to come Yeah, in. so, I mean, I was going to say the same thing. The, the thing is that we know for sure um, that if this works, it will help our hospitals, but it certainly won't empty the hospitals, and it won't allow us to... It will probably just allow us to manage in a better way. It won't be able to reduce the number of beds and so on, because we know that the rate we're running at currently. Therefore, when we're talking about the money, you know, I think we will come to a point where either we will have to make an argument nationally that this should be funded because it's the right thing to do, or we're going to have to take a risk-based approach to saying we're not going to fund something else and we're going to fund this instead. Uh, and that's the difficulty that we're going to have as a, as a, as a board and a, as organisations across South West London. But I think it's worth us being really clear about that. This is nationally funded at the moment for the next two years. Thank you. So we've got three more questions that I'm going to take. So Mercy, Karen, then Dagmar. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering about the monitoring and review. So presumably you're looking at readmittance rates, um, readmittance if, if that happens, and maybe the impact on, on family or on people at, um, alone at home, you know, just to get a kind of a feel of, of that difference.
difference and what families are doing really to support that. Yeah, so as I said, we are looking at, um, we have set up a CQI process. I mean, bearing in mind this new model is not going to be in place till the end of November, um, where we'll have the remote monitoring hub operating with the four local virtual wards. The four local virtual wards are ramping up right now, so capacity on the ground is increasing, but the uh, remote monitoring hub won't be in action until the end of, end of next month. Um, but uh, we've, got, we've set up a CQI process where we review data and readmission rate would be, uh, I mean, sometimes it's appropriate readmission um, and sometimes it's not. Um, so we'll be looking at that information as, as we go through on a monthly basis to understand if we could done things better uh, and to build that into our processes. M Martin, could I just ask you to explain what the CQI is? Our continuous quality improvement, apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Given the conversation, given the fact that this will be a requirement of self-funding as we go forward, do you want to just give us a view or give us some, some thoughts on the evaluative criteria and if you haven't yet looked at that, how you'll develop those so that we can get to a point where we can evaluate the success of virtual wards? Yeah, on the evaluation criteria. So um, looking at um, how the usage of it, I guess, is really important. Um, are we getting the throughput through, through this? Because I think one of the key things around this is um, convincing clinical, uh, clinical staff, particularly acute consultants, to utilise the service. So usage will be one of the key areas, readmission rates particularly, experience of the individuals, um, so feedback from patients who go through this is also going to be key. Um, and, you know, looking at sort of core rates, escalations, how well escalations went, etc. So following through the SOPs, you know, d data that, that details how affected SOPs were. SOPs. Oh, so standard operating procedures, apologies. Um, uh, so evaluating those, see how effective they were. Um, so, so there's a number of criteria that, that actually most was created um, and we're looking how we collect that. And will you also be looking at the acute, the impact on the acute sector? Oh yeah, absolutely. So understanding sort of if we're seeing a reduction in length of stay particularly um, for these cohorts that we're targeting. Um, so the key sort of um, uh, specialties we're starting with are um, frailty and respiratory and then we're looking at heart failure um, and other, other gastroenterology and other, other illnesses. So looking at uh, admissions and whether those admissions we're seeing reduced length of stay is another key. key uh, and that will be actually critical in improving the case going forward. Thanks, Dagmar. Um, hi, thanks very much. And um, as everybody said, in principle, absolutely um, um, what we want. I wanted to understand a little bit more about public and patient engagement in the wider sense because actually you know these are really sick patients that stay at home that is quite stressful and scary and the idea that the people surrounding these sick people think oh my god it's they're not in the right place they're not cared for properly i do feel we haven't had enough of that conversation with um, uh, the public and patients, particularly with our diverse communities as well, yeah? Other languages, other expectations. So I think that needs to be part and parcel of the pilot. And I would think it lends itself to really be strengthened a bit in the evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. One of the thing, areas we're looking at is d digital exclusion. Um, and so looking at those communities that um, might typically be uh, affected by this and looking at whether we're getting admissions through the virtual wards in t from those communities so we can understand um, if we're having an impact in those, in, you know, in those communities. Um, we have done some engagement and these, this model of care has been running for some time in a number of areas. In Croydon particularly, this model is, is, is in place and we've got uh, I was at the uh, HET conference, which is a tech, uh, an IT conference two weeks ago, and there was patients from Croydon talking publicly about the fantastic experience they had on this. So uh, I think it's really powerful. The, the, the other, uh, other thing I would add to that is the fact that we've got a 24-7 remote monitoring hub, so you've got a nurse on the phone 24-7 will provide a lot of confidence, both to clinicians but particularly to the individual patient. 
I'm sorry, I think, uh, and they will be able to ring and check if they're okay. They'll be able to detect if someone's anxious and, and put extra support in for them. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, the majority... Oh, thank you. Yeah, so, sorry, Ruth, I should have perhaps added uh, when I was talking before, we actually have the steering group today for, uh, on this, and I'll definitely reflect some of these comments into that so people have got it in their head straight away. Um, but we are working through the sort of practical uh, go live aspects now. 28th of November still the date that we're working to, uh, likely to be slightly phased in terms of time during the day, so Martin's just referenced 24 hours, that is where we're going to go as quickly as possible, but we're likely to start to build that from a 12 to 16 hour start, just in terms of testing how this is working, what's you know, some of the challenges, etc. Bear in mind this is quite a different thing, and I thought for completeness we should probably just note that to the board. Thank you, Matthew, and I think it's good if you could take the sense of the discussion that we've had today back to that board. So I think there's three main aspects that we've reflected on. Um, uh, so uh, the impact, the importance of the impact assessment um, and ensuring that in doing that we understand the impacts on partners across the system. Secondly, that that needs to inform a set of choices for the ICB in terms of funding of this once the um, uh, the NHS e funding uh, is finished and then I think we've had a really good discussion about the culture change both in the sense of um, practitioners and clinicians and their understanding of how this can benefit but also in terms of patients and service users and thinking about exclusion and hard to reach communities so I'd be grateful if you could reflect that um, Matthew and Martin in terms of how we take this forward. On the basis of that, is the board happy to approve the business case and could I have a show of hands please? Thank you. Moving on then to uh, item 8, which is the board assurance framework. So could I ask Ben to uh, speak to this item please? Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is the first time that we have brought the Board Assurance Framework, the BAF, uh, to the Board. The, board, the BAF usually comes uh, twice a year uh, to the Board in September uh, and <coughs> March. And I think it's just worth noting that the BAF is a, a living document that we're continuing to uh, develop uh, as the organisation itself uh, develops. So the purpose of the BAF is to inform the Board uh, of our highest scoring risks <clears throat> that could affect the achievement uh, of our corporate objectives. Um, our, our risk reporting cycle uh, around this runs on a two-monthly uh, basis, and as well as the uh, board assurance framework, which reflects those highest scoring risks, we also have a more detailed corporate risk register uh, that sits behind this. So over the coming months, uh, we will continue to uh, develop, uh, evolve uh, and review uh, both the BAF uh, and our corporate risk register to ensure that we are capturing uh, and reflecting uh, the risks uh, that are uh, facing the uh, organisation and that we're doing that uh, uh, accurately uh, and appropriately. Um, I, I won't go through the actual paper in detail, Chair, I presume people have uh, read that, uh, but as you can see, uh, at this point in the development of the BAF, uh, there are six risks uh, which score over 15, uh, and we've got one risk uh, that is just uh, below 15, uh, as detailed in the paper. I'm very happy to take uh, questions, and uh, my colleagues around the table will be able to comment on uh, specific risks uh, if they wish to. Thank you. So Sarah first. Yeah, can I just say, I think it's important to remember that this is a new organisation. First time we've seen the Board Assurance Framework. We will need to do some work together, I think, as a board to, to ensure that we feel that the Board Assurance Framework reflects our high priorities and risks as, as a board that we, uh, and that we're all signed up to that. So as part of our organisational development framework, I think we might need to pick up some work on this. So we have inherited some risks from the old CCG and other parts of the system. So it's, it is a, a, a piece of work in development rather than a fully formed uh, board assurance framework. Thank you, Sarah. Any other? Jacqueline. So um, I suppose I get a bit concerned that the quality risk is, is lowest than anybody else. So you would help hope that. 
But given when you look at some of the risks we've got, so access to emergency care, we know there is evidence that actually patients are coming to harm because of either ambulance delays or delays in the ED department getting into a bed. So we know that already, so that is right. But it, it's, the bit for me is how does it then link into the quality bit? Because quality per se is one thing, and then, and then, but it, it does link into that and the money, actually. So I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm questioning that score, and I know this is a new thing and we're, we're feeling our way, but how we link it all in so that it's not all done separately. Because for, for me, quality is a really high risk at the moment for all the things, reasons I've just said. And I, I know, looking at Vanessa, she'd say, and then we've got mental health and Dan Dan. So for me, I think we probably just need to rethink that one in light of some of the other risks. Thank you, Jackie. I'm just going to ask Gloria to briefly come back to you on that. So, Jackie, I totally agree with you. And I think, each, I think that's some of the things we might want to work on going forward, that each of the risks should actually identify where quality is being imparted. And that will be incorporated into everything we do. I totally agree that we shouldn't be separating it. But the quality risk we have there is about developing quality at place and that transition bit. And that's why discovering is lower. But I think some of the things you raise in terms of UAC delays and so on and so forth, there is definitely quality impact in almost every risk. And that should be identified in all, all the risk. So I have to ask that actually the quality risk we've got, I think it needs Sarah, so I think that's exactly the point I was making that I think we need as a board yeah. to identify what we want on our board assurance framework which might not just be an escalation of risks but actually our high priorities and how we perceive the risks in the system um, and I do think that might be an OD for us as a board to do going forwards um, and, and we have inherited some of it as well, the actual risks and, and the way they're written but I definitely think there's room for us to, to change that. Vanessa. So, uh, two points. Um, the uh, risk in connection to mental health, I'd really like to work on through the partnership delivery group that we've set up. So, I'd be really happy to contribute with that and, and to get that risk into, because I think it is broader than just our emergency departments, it's across um, the board. But it's, it's helpful to at least have a placeholder here. And then the second was a, a, a question as a place convener, uh, which is we're doing work. In, at our place on our executive, effectively, the executive risk registers, and it's how that then for, feeds into the board assurance framework and up and down, isn't it? Um, and, I, and I think it would be useful to have some timelines from you, Ben, about actually when would you like us to produce our place risk registers in order to then be able to feed into this piece of work so that it's a much more collaborative uh, piece, of, uh, piece of work, but thank you. Thanks very much. So um, I was pleased to see the risk around failure to modernise and fully utilise our estates on the board assurance framework, but actually going through this in detail it felt a, a little bit narrow in terms of it, it mainly focused around voids and specifically QMH. I, I, for me actually our risk around estates is much, much broader than that and I wondered if we could look at um, broadening the, the risk and articulating a slightly wider set of controls as well, um, particularly given some of the, the wider economic challenges in the, in the capital environment at the moment. Sarah. Also, I think we just need to work out ourselves how are we going to do this as a system because what we're not, you know, we don't want to reflect every provider's risk on our risk register. Um, so what is it that as an ICB are our risks? And how do we reflect those in a way that we're not cutting across individual organisational statutory responsibility, but we take account of the kind of oversight function of the ICB. So it is going to be, it's new and different, I think, and I think that's kind of reflected in where we are and where we need to be. So uh, just, just for some thinking for people. Thanks. Ben, can I ask you to come back on those questions, please? Uh, yes, so certainly, so uh, I think to uh, Jacqueline's point, I think um, uh, Gloria's picked up and we'll, we'll work on that broader risk uh, for the next round. Uh, mental health ones are absolutely, um, uh, Vanessa, and we've been working with Tonya and, uh, as well, and Mosa, we're linking with yourself and, and through that route. Um, uh, the team have started to talk to um, uh, place teams uh, uh, about how we do that uh, risk reporting from place, so uh, absolutely, uh, and it would be great to work with you uh, on um, that. And, uh, 
uh, to the estate points, James. Um, uh, Helen and I have been talking a lot about that uh, uh, that risk uh, over the last few weeks as well. So yes, absolutely, we'll feed that into the review process for the next for the next round. Uh, thank you. So um, what I'm going to ask uh, the board to do is approve the board assurance framework, but on the basis that we need to do some further work as a board, and in particular. Uh, broadening out the risk on estates, thinking about how the uh, work at place on risk will feed into this process, the interplay of the risks and their impact on the quality risk, um, and that we probably need to spend some time as a board working through these issues. But on the basis of what we have here, we approve for further work. People can tend to do that. Yes. Yep. Thank you. So, moving on to item nine, which is the ICP update. So, if I could ask Ruth to come in, please. Thank you, and thanks for this opportunity. I think it's really important that we have this way of working across both the board and the partnership. So, I really welcome the fact that this is now an item on the agenda. Um, we've now had the second meeting of the partnership. There's a real sense of purpose and determination to make this work, but also, I think, a growing recognition of just how complex the system is, um, which doesn't mean we're not going to... We are most definitely going to get through it, but it is extremely complicated. Each borough, as you know, has um, a place board, has a health and wellbeing board, has a lot of people working very hard within the local communities to achieve the best possible outcomes for our residents. And to bring this together into one place and to talk about the overarching principles that should be governing us all is complicated, but if we get it right, my goodness, it could make a real difference. Um, the driver for this has to be about health inequalities, recognising that over decades, I would argue, um, we haven't really managed to address those terrible health, social, economic uh, inequalities that exist within our boroughs. There are huge areas of deprivation uh, within our six boroughs, and in spite of the reputation that South West London has with the rest of London to be a relatively affluent and leafy place, we all know that isn't true, and there are people who are really struggling. And if I think about what's happening at the moment, where we know that children are coming to school hungry, uh, where each borough is having to set up a warm centre in order that people can have a safe and warm place, so they can not have to turn on the heating at home, and to hear conversations from people telling us that they cannot afford to heat their homes um, or else provide decent meals for their children and asking us desperately for advice. It really gives a sense of the urgency. And I think the thing that underpins this for me is the risk that we are so focused on the immediate and the immediate emergency, which is real over the winter, that we take away the focus from the long term. And the long term has to be about prevention, early intervention. We heard Vanessa at the last meeting that a lot of um, issues around mental health happened by the age of 13, 14. It's true of mental health, it's true of physical health as well. So we're going to have to somehow bring together the, the need for urgency to help people get through this winter with the increasing constraints on our funding. Uh, we all know that the financial situation for all of us is dire and yet the need is increasing. So it is important, I think, that while we bring together an understanding of what's happening across the wider place, across our six boroughs, we also get better at focusing where the priorities are and what is going to make a difference. And I think that is very much the role of the partnership, which can then help to influence the work that we're doing here on the board. I think there's a real potential here. As I said, all the partners are up for this looking specifically at Simon Breeze, representing the voluntary community sector, but talking to community pharmacists, talking to the wider system, everyone recognises that things have to change. Um, and the way it has to change is that we work differently and better together. We do need to focus on the immediate, as I say, the winter crisis, and interestingly, the next item is exactly on that. Um, but we need to carry on thinking about what will actually make a difference long term and mean that people won't need to access those acute services later on in life. So there's a lot of work to do, but I am feeling very positive. Um, there's quite a bit of governance going on at the moment, but that's important too, because we need to understand how all the bits fit together. And I look forward to giving an update at the next meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. And I think it's really important that we understand the interplay between the two committees. So these are um, really key for the uh, Integrated Care Board. Any questions for Ruth? Sarah? I, I thought it was just important to state that, that obviously the Integrated Care Partnership will be developing 
the strategy for the next five years, of which we will, as an ICB and local authorities, will need to respond um, when those priorities are set by the ICP. We will need to feed that into our delivery plans as we go forward. And I do think that's really important. There's a real opportunity there for us across NHS local authorities and partners to really make a difference. Where if, I mean, we've got to go through the process to identify those priorities, but I think there's a real opportunity there for all of us. Thank you. I'll just um, ask uh, Matthew and Dick, and then Ruth, I'll give you the opportunity to respond. Yeah, I was just thinking about the description Ruth gave and the previous conversation we had on risk and Sarah's point about what are the ICB risks as opposed to statutory agency risks. I, I haven't quite formed it in my head, but there's something out from what Ruth has just described that probably, having looked at what we've put as our ICB risks, that we could also add in to respond and ensure that we're sort of focused on that aspect of our work uh, as opposed to the ICB risks just being a system version of what we've all got in our own risk registers as statutory organisations. So it's not a fully formed thought, but I think it's worth raising and might help us a little bit to capture some of the things that we've saying. Uh, th thank you, Ruth. I, I just wanted to go back to... Uh, Ruth Dombey's uh, point about priorities, because it, it does strike me as we, as the strategy is, is developed and, and discussed, there's a risk of um, uh, seeing all the things we'd ideally like to do, but we live in a very uh, non-ideal world with all sorts, of, all sorts of problems sort of getting in the way. And the more we can think about obstacles and the ways in which the different organisations that make up the partnership can survive helping the collective outcomes we're, we're, we're searching for and being quite hard-headed about, about that, I suspect that will increase the chances of us having a developing a really powerful strategy that has traction and, and gets real commitment that, that organisations know they can viably keep pushing for over the sort of timescale we need to address some of these big shifts in the sort of inequalities that that you were describing, Ruth. Um, so I wonder if we can find a place for obstacles and challenges, the, the, the difficult bit, uh, as well as the aspiration, to help us be more, more realistic and effective in developing a strategy. I think Mercy wants to come in, and then Ruth, I'll come back to you. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's really just more of a comment. I, th I think um, why... Um, why the integrated care system is being set up is to look at prevention and health inequalities. Um, and so it is about us um, and as an IC board and an IC partnership getting that balance right. Um, so I think that is our biggest challenge as, as uh, Matthew and, and Dick has um, been saying, looking at kind of risk and looking at priorities. But I think if we don't get that right, then we wouldn't have done our job. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, and I, was, I agree with all of that. Um, I'm just, as we go forward with the work of the board, I'd like to see a greater understanding of the of the impact on the system of the general, or of, in general, of the, of the decisions that we're taking here. I recognise this is an NHS board. I recognise that what we're doing is relatively constrained. But if we're talking about discharge to assess, if we're talking about virtual wards, these are all decisions and pieces of work that have an impact on the wider community and on all the partners. And I really think it's important within the work that we're doing in the board that we recognise that. The point you made, Dagmar, about also ensuring that our communities understand what we're doing is absolutely important as well. And I think the partnership has an important role to play in helping with that too. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And I think we all agree with that sentiment in terms of uh, the decisions that we take here. So is everybody content to note the report? Thank you. Moving on to item 10, um, winter preparedness. Uh, so can I ask <coughs> Matthew and Jonathan to speak to this item? Okay, thank you very much, Ruth. I think I'm, um, I think I'm starting this, so thank you very much, uh, Ruth. So um, we did have some conversation about this last month, given the importance of uh, winter. So <coughs> colleagues will have seen much of what's set out here before. But to give a very brief summary, there are eight areas that have been determined 
nationally is really important for us to, to focus on to address the, the, the immense pressures that Ruth has already talked about a little earlier and we all recognise uh, in the system at the moment. And just there's, there's um, details in the papers on each, but just to mention them, they are immunisations, that's including things like COVID and flu vaccinations, um, primary care and capacity in primary care for this winter, how 111 and 999 services are going to support us through this period, a specific uh, ask around category two, so that's for patients with stroke, for example, and how we ensure effective ambulance response times for those sorts of patients, uh, how we reduce crowding in emergency departments across South West London, hospital occupancy, uh, which we've already touched on through some of the work around the virtual ward, linked also to timely discharge and the eighth area being for support for people living in their uh, own homes. And I said we spent some time on that this morning with the conversation about virtual ward. In addition to those eight priorities, when we were thinking about this in early summer, we felt there were five other areas that felt really important to us in South West London. So um, the first was mental health, so there's a particular focus on that. There was another piece around how we manage winter surge and winter pressures and emergency preparedness, so there's some information on that. Workforce, supporting our workforce given all the immense pressures and challenges uh, felt like a really important area to touch upon. How we communicate with the local population and also, as we've also uh, just been talking about, linked to the board assurance framework, uh, quality and patient safety and the work um, Gloria, John and others are doing with medical director, nursing director, colleagues across the uh, patch in relation to reflecting on the impact of people uh, having uh, long lengths of time in emergency departments and uh, to access um, care. And the reason um, we pushed on at pace with that through the summer was there was uh, just over £13 million worth of resources allocated to South West London by NHS England uh, and we made the decision, as, been, as has been reported earlier in this meeting last month, uh, to allow maximum time for people to secure the staff they need and to put um, services in place. We made the decision about how that was going to be invested last month. Uh, the paper sets out the detail of that. It describes how we'll put the equivalent of 157 additional beds in, in the system uh, to support people through the, this winter. And there's, there's almost 20 uh, individual schemes set out in the in the slide that describe uh, how we uh, draw together to that total of additional uh, beds and additional uh, capacity at, at this uh, point in time. Um, so that's probably all I wanted to say other than uh, probably just to pick up also on Ruth's point about um, think forward thinking. So we are trying to do that in this space. So 60 or 70 people across the system met on the 8th of July to think about what we could do to support care this winter across the system. And then we re-met, reconvened a couple of weeks ago on the 30th of September. All the local authorities were, were, were there and other partners across the system to talk about what, what could we do to move to a more sustainable model version of emergency care over the next five year period. So at a point in time that might be something that we want to think about how we how we play that back here, but uh, just to, I thought the point was well made about it's, it's both what we need to do to manage the short term and the, the, the men's pressures face at the moment, but also think a, a little further ahead about how to support the system going forward. So um, that is the other element I probably want to call out. So that's probably all I wanted to say. I'll ask my co-SRO, Matthew, whether you have anything you'd like to add. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Just a couple of points, Ruth, if I can, because um, uh, I endorse what uh, Jonathan said. Uh, I mean, we've had a lot, we've got a lot of work in play already, um, which is a good thing, uh, and many of those schemes are running and are full already. Um, uh, and that's positive in that we've cracked on, but it does mean that the challenges that we're still to face are likely to require more than we have in play at this moment. Uh, uh, I was on call yesterday, I've been in my ED this morning, uh, and uh, it feels pretty much like midwinter already, and of course it's 
not. It's still sunshiny outside at this point. Um, so I think we have to be clear with the board that there is definitely more work to be done uh, for this winter. That is not to denigrate any of the work that's been done uh, thus far by anybody, uh, all partners who are involved in that, right across South West London and each of the only delivery boards I chair mine in Croydon, but we have a South West London uh, infrastructure and there's definite you know, commitment uh, and a, a good deal of experience in running uh, the winter and uh, emergency response more generally. Uh, I, I would say the impact on patients and staff shouldn't be underestimated. I think Jacqueline makes a very important point about the risk register uh, and the bath. Um, <laughs> certainly from a patient's perspective, waits are too long um, uh, and that's not what we want. <coughs> There's understandable reasons for that, but that doesn't take away from the plain fact that they are uh, patients waiting too long in all aspects of our service at the moment. And uh, I think that's also important to just flag that this isn't just sometimes it, it's easy to think it's ambulances or it's A&E or it's this is a whole pathway uh, issue um, uh, including primary care um, but also including community services uh, acute services and social care uh, as well uh, so shouldn't impact shouldn't uh, ignore that impact on patients or indeed staff um, uh, and I think one of our key responsibilities obviously individual organizations but also as a uh, sort of the leadership of South West London, um, we need to make sure that we're uh, using our powers to support those staff, to engage with those staff uh, and to uh, give them reassurance that we are continuing to do work on this and uh, most importantly for the patients that they know that that is also uh, our objective for this winter. So I don't think this is going to be an easy period and there's going to be some real challenges during this time and that's stating the very obvious but I think worth saying uh, and noting here at the board uh, and that we're not underestimating the challenge but also uh, we're, you know, we've got a lot in play at the moment, more to come uh, and we'll continue to support everybody in that endeavour. Thank you uh, Jonathan and Matthew. Can I take questions please from the board? I just think we, I mean, we ought to have a discussion about this. this is, I think this is one of our biggest risks, actually, and it's for the whole system. It's not just for the NHS, um, particularly with the, we've talked about the risks spread across the system. Uh, often the risk is not to the people that are in hospital, but it's the people that are not yet in hospital, but actually can't get into hospital because they are still out in the community and we can't get ambulances to them and so on. So I do think, um, I wondered how much we've thought about the risk-based approach and how we actually think about risk differently. I know that Jacqueline has raised this with us uh, previously, how we think about risk across the system in a different way because we do tend to focus on what's in hospital rather than what's outside of hospital. And I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, can I add to that as well um, about the workforce risks, which I know have been flagged in this report. And I think Matthew, quite rightly, you've talked about um, the impact on both patients, but also staff across the system. And I'd just really welcome a bit more information about how those risks are being managed from a workforce perspective through the group that you're working with. So I'll start on both and then Jonathan can, can add. Uh, I mean, in terms of how we try and manage risk across the system, I mean, that is uh, not straightforward um, because there will be some aspects of that that we won't know about as easily as others. You know, some of it you can see is right in your face. Um, uh, and uh, that's sometimes the area, therefore, that you put the effort into. Uh, the, the short answer is the A&E delivery boards that exist, terrible title, I should say, because they're not actually about A&E, but that is the nomenclature that we're <coughs> encouraged strongly to use, so that's what we're using. Um, but those urgent and emergency care conversations have all partners in, uh, and uh, LAS, for example, uh, in our uh, um, uh, sessions in Croydon, and I'm sure it's replicated across the piece are raising the issues of the patients that are in the stack to use a whole bit of jargon but the list of patients who are waiting to be picked up by an ambulance because those are some of the patients that we're less sighted on uh, and are less obvious so the uh, the a delivery boards is the mechanism by which those risk conversations should be taking place on a monthly basis now obviously on a daily basis uh, we're looking at uh, trying to 
operationalise that. Uh, and there's all sorts of initiatives that are now being developed. Um, Jacqueline might want to talk about the North Bristol model, for example, which they're piloting in uh, parts of her patch, uh, which is to try and say, OK, well, if we've got real pressures in the whole system, how might we spread some of that in a way that we haven't before by increasing numbers of patients on wards to allow patients to be offloaded in uh, from ambulances, which consequently allows patients who are currently just people out in the community to be picked up by the ambulance and then speed that process up. Now, that is not without its challenge. It's not without its risks. There is a discussion about how that risk is balanced, but it's an active conversation that I know Jacqueline's team are on and we're starting to look at our version of that. And we were at a chief execs meeting on Thursday last week where nationally that was being uh, encouraged uh, to be uh, assessed. So it's those sorts of things I'd say from a, how we try and manage risk that we can easily see and risks that perhaps are slightly less obvious from a patient and the population's perspective. In terms of workforce, I mean, if we had an answer to an easy answer to that question, then we'd be very, very popular because uh, everybody is struggling on that uh, in all parts of the system. You know, I was talking to my GP colleagues uh, at the end of last week, they're experiencing it, social care is experiencing it, we've seen the numbers of social care staff dropping down a little bit nationally, um, uh, certainly the pressures uh, in my uh, own organisation are as acute as anybody else's. So the issue is very clear, um, I think the immediate thing we can do is to support our staff the best way we possibly can because we are not going to magic wand a solution on workforce for this winter. Uh, there are things that we can do and be a little bit flexible uh, about those in terms of how we recruit and crucially retain uh, our staff. But at the moment, our focus has to be on supporting the staff that we have in play and trying to make their day-to-day -day experience as good as it can be. And in parallel, then do work on, so what does the future look like? And that, I think, from my perspective, needs to include a whole load of different things like apprenticeships and building on that, and about bringing in a different type of workforce, and rather than just keeping going what we're doing and backfilling the gaps we've got with locum, agency, overseas recruits, etc., all of which have a place, but we have a big workforce in our local patch uh, that we could probably do a darn sight better for them and for us by accessing. And I think that's probably the area that I'd say we need to push on. But is that going to solve my challenge on workforce in six weeks' time? No, it's not. The thing that's going to do that is my staff feeling like they're supported and engaged and that they've got some a level of control in what feels like at times a very uncontrollable situation. So that's me being very straight and honest with you. Thank you, Matthew. Jonathan. Uh, just, just to sort of add to what Matthew's saying, we're, around risk, I think it's a really interesting point that, that Sarah's raising. We, we have set up a, a clinical forum that works with the Urgent Emergency Care Board across primary and secondary care to talk about clinical risk. Um, but the, it, it's a complex area given, patient, you know, given the clinician's responsibility to the patient sat in front of them versus the people they probably don't know who are out there in the community who do need access to care. Um, but we are trying, Matthew and I are trying to sort of formalise that group and uh, try and get some clearer <coughs> outputs about how we might support the management of clinical risk. I think it's vital to the conversation we had about virtual wards earlier, that there's some collective agreement between secondary and primary care about the cohorts of patients, their complexity and how, how they are managed uh, across. So I just wanted to sort of say under the auspices of the Urgent Emergency Care Programme that that work is um, in train. And also on workforce to that reset event I was mentioning earlier on the 30th of September, there was some th thinking uh, that emerged out of that. There are things we can do, you know, perhaps some of the flexible contracting arrangements might be an area we want to explore across all our organisations to optimise how we make the most of the sort of 60,000 people who work in the um, NHS in South West London. So the, but as Matthew also says, it's not going to fix it for this winter, Ruth. This is a, this is a, a long, long challenge that we, we face and I think we all recognise that but on both points we are we are uh, um, focused and energised. <laughs> Important thank you. Dagmar. Um, yeah I just wanted to come back to workforce um, absolutely I mean that spans the whole system um, so keeping the current workforce healthy is just one aspect and Obviously, vaccination, you, everybody's tired of even thinking, hearing it, but it is so important and we haven't exactly got a run-in 
for the autumn booster or the flu, particularly from staff. So again, sharing and reinvigorating. I haven't got like um, recipes up my sleeve, but that is certainly something concrete that is within our gift. Um, the other thing is around um, mental health and burnout. Um, so the remaining staff facing that winter thinking, how on earth am I coping? Just thinking a bit more now about that. Um, these are the two things. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to ask John and then Vanessa to come in and then I'll go back to John again. Um, so it's, it's really important that we talk about the workforce. I was just going to digress a little bit into mental health and see that it's, it's good to see that's one of the key priorities and area of focus. Um, there is obviously investment going into mental health um, in terms of lock person bed and some um, pathway redesign. And um, can I just ask Vanessa, the sense of oh uh, apologies. Uh, do you want to need to start again or do you think okay? So just in terms of the mental health block purchase of beds, bearing in mind Claire Murdoch's letter about quality of care and restrictive practices, is there anything more that we need to do in terms of assuring ourselves that if and when patients do go out of area? that the same standards of care which would be applied either with yourselves or SLAM are applied, being applied in the independent sector. So um, <clears throat> I don't think investment is being made into the block purchase of beds that's coming at an overspend um, to the Mental Health Trust, just so we're clear, but, but it's the right thing to do. The reason we've decided to go for a block purchase is in order to secure beds clo as close to home as possible and to ensure that we can access beds with, um, uh, with, the, with the appropriate CQC rating, etc. We ensure through our bed management system that every patient who's placed in the private sector has um, robust follow-up um, and that we maintain contact with their families, etc., and that the quality standards are met wherever possible. It always becomes more complex the more the multiple people that you use. So our idea would be obviously to manage within our existing bed base or to extend our existing bed base to, a, to facilitate um, care closer to home and we are working at proposals to do that. Um, I think one of, the, one of the points from the conversation today is if it's not just the number of people is it it's the acuity of the presentations and what i would say in mental health is it's the acuity of the presentation um, and the the level of unwellness when people are requiring the bed that is really the issue so our average length of stay which is not a um a hundred percent scientific tool has significantly increased um uh, you know it's increased by four or five days because people are needing longer in order to recover and if we could get people into us quicker then the, then, then the hope is that they wouldn't be in hospital as long and the restrictive interventions uh, wouldn't be in place. You'll be aware that the Panorama programme focused on long stay, um, uh, on, our, on a, not long stay, but rehabilitation um, uh, forensic um, services. And what we've done is particularly focused on those patients with the most complex of presentations, which tend to evoke very strong um, reactions between the patient group and the staff group and how we manage and foster culturally um, competent and thoughtful conversations. So that would be my, res my response to that. And then in, in addition, what I would say is we've talked a lot about our paid workforce here, um, but there is a unpaid workforce in our carers, family and friends that I think the more that we can do to support the networks that support them um, to facilitate um, resilience this winter is probably one of the wisest um, things that we could do in addition to all the great work that goes on at the emergency care boards. <coughs> Thank you. Any um, responses to those issues? I mean, I th yeah, <laughs> I, I wouldn't disagree with anything that's been said. I think it's important to note the breadth of the points that are being made uh, and we'll definitely continue that work ourselves in the urgent emergency care work stream so yeah, i wouldn't disagree with the points being made right thank you um, sarah can i just ask um in terms of how as a board we maintain oversight of both the short-term risks that we've talked about in relation to this but also most importantly as ruth has said keeping a eye on what are the longer term developments that we need to reflect on as we come out of winter and thinking about how we um, uh, you know, address some of those risks that are long term risks in the system. 
So I think we can ask Jonathan and Matthew, they, they're, as, as they mentioned, there is some work going on where we did two workshops to think about the long-term strategy for urgent and emergency care. I think that should come back to the board uh, with the priorities for that and, and make sure that we're all comfortable that, that that is going the right direction. And we will ensure also that the board receives regular updates throughout the winter on where we are on delivery on a day-to-day -day basis. So we will make sure, I think, that we bring both items back to a future board. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So on the basis of the discussion that we've had, is the board content to note the report? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we now have a short comfort break, so we can take 15 minutes. Um, if I could ask everybody to be back for 11.35, please, and we'll have the integrated care board reports. Could everybody take their seats, please? Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so we're now going to go on to item 11, which is the integrated care board reports. So at each ICB board meeting, we receive formal reports from the quality, performance and finance functions. Um, the first report is from the quality team and Dr. Gloria Rowland, our chief nursing officer, who will talk us through the report. Thank you. Good. Uh, I just want to say we, we, are, we are trying different mechanisms to report in a way that it will be sustained and not actually be more meaningful to the board. But most of the details and the, the digging down happens at the quality and oversight committee and chair by mercy. Um, what we've done this time around is to actually divide it into four different areas under safe, experience, well led, and effective. Um, what I would say is that in terms of the metrics, we do have a, roughly about 66 quality metrics that we need to report nationally, but we've picked the key important ones. And later on, I'll talk about the dashboard. We've created a quality dashboard in the system, which in a way, apart from the ones we report here, if anyone triggers, we will actually then report that report. So we are developing a framework to really be able to do, to do that. Uh, so I'm not going to talk um, fully in terms of each of the items here, but I'm just going to pick a few, few of the metrics. So on that save, I've looked at I've picked never event, and I'm not going to say much about never event. event. There are really two things that are really driving our performance there, is in terms of retaining foreign objects and wrong side surgery. However, it's just to say when we benchmark ourselves against London, we are actually second best in London. That is not to say I've never if event is the right thing to do. However, and I know a massive did challenge us at the class quality that we should look at the whole of UK and we benchmark. So that will be our next work going forward. Also, we've also done a deep dive into what is really driving that for the past five years. Again, that report will go through the quality committee and will bring key highlights to this board. Um, and you can see other things like never event and so on and so forth. We've already analyzed there, and what we've done in this report is not to just report the numbers. We've talked about what we want to do, actions and improvements that we want to make in those aspects. Another area that I want to highlight is IPC and COVID. IPC, we were doing well, but we've seen slight increase in like E. coli. But more importantly, in terms of COVID, numbers has actually significantly gone up in the last few weeks. So we've got a few admi hospital admissions, and we are looking at that closely. That is not translating yet to um, ITU admission yet, but we are watching closely, and I think some of the hospitals are already stepping out their preventative measures, such, such as few of them are already using masks in the clinical areas, and we're also probably implementing testing in the areas. So I just want to highlight that. In terms of patient experience, I just want to say there are multiple factors that is driving patient experience, and um, one area that we are looking at is how do we really triangulate safety, experience, and, um, and the risk register? What is on the risk? How do we triangulate that? We are, we are purchasing a software called Radar, and that is where all these different um, reporting is going to be sitting. And that Radar system, the work is to help us triangulate and actually bring out key issues early so that we can be more proactive. And I just want to mention that in terms of uh, patient experience. In terms of some of our highlights, in terms of our complaints, 
in the ICS, the main area of focus is around um, the continuous healthcare and it's more or less around communication because it's a very emotive topic whereby there's financial importance attached to it. So definitely we do get complaints around that in terms of abuse and so on and so forth. And, um, and I think finally I just want to mention some of the, we did mention five risk areas in our report and I just want to mention one that we actually debated more at our quality board and it's to say our primary care, I think we, we can actually promise that we have good good understanding primary care system across uh, Southwest London in terms of GP practices. And I've written here roughly almost about 75% are actually very good. But we do have about 12 practices that are rated requires improvement and um, requires improvement and inadequate. And this is about six or seven percent of them. But what we want to do is to strengthen that just to concentrate on that to be more proactive because some of those GP practices have also closed due to quality issues. We want to be proactive so that we don't get to that stage whereby surgeries are closed. While we are doing well, we don't really want any any practice to be actually be sure. To, find, to be found wanting within the system. So that would be our key focus, really looking at those surgeries that are greater requires improvement and, and, um, and inadequate across the system. I just want to mention that. In terms of some of the developmental work that we are doing in terms of quality oversight, we are continually working with place to develop the place and um, the place quality framework. And we are meeting with individual place to just agree on how we make sure that we strengthen that and the full implementation of the new framework really go ahead. Um, that, that I want to mention. And also to say, in terms of um, urgent and emergency care, and I know Jonathan alluded to that, we are doing some quality work in terms of looking at arm. Um, I'm caused by delays. So that work is still progressing and we are looking at reporting the first lot around January time. And like I said earlier on, we are developing a quality dashboard. We are just at the stage of <coughs> um, testing. And hopefully when that is alive, that will be, be able to help us escalate this easily and help us to be more proactive in terms of dealing with quality issues in the system. And also in terms of our quality strategy is one of the key areas we have to develop. We have done a first draft of the quality strategy. It's now go, it's gone back to the system for people to just comment and hopefully we'll be finalizing and going through the quality um, committee for that to be ratified and finally here for it to be signed off. At the back of our report is just talking about next steps in terms of some of the things we're going to be doing. And finally, this is just for the board to note and just to say that we are strengthening our collaboration with other partners within the system. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gloria. Can I bring Mercy in as well, who chairs the committee? Um, yeah, I was going to make some comments generally, actually, uh, just about what we're doing on quality and oversight committee, just to reassure the board. Um, obviously, we've only met a few times and we look at both quality and performance. Um, I think we, it's true to say we're finding our feet as a committee um, and uh, we've just appointed um, patient safety reps as well um, and they, they need to join us. Um, I think it's important that as a committee we, um, we make sure that we're looking at the whole system and looking at accountability but that we're not kind of reinventing the wheel and, and kind of um, doing kind of double assurance that's already done at provider or place level. I'm quite keen that we don't do that because it's really a waste of our time um, because those um, assurances at kind of local provider level are, are you know, kind of um, are, are good and so we need to use our time most effectively, I, I think. Um, so we are looking at a range of um, kind of areas that we've I'm going to explore in more detail. I think that's a better use of the committee, as well as obviously assuring the, the board before these reports come to the board that we, we've had a kind of a, a look at them, that we've inquired into them as, um, as uh, Gloria says, I challenge some things um, as well. Um, but, uh, but obviously having the whole board look at them too is, is good. Um, so yes, yeah, so we I think we're uh, developing. Uh, we know that um, though we've we've started with um, a certain legacy that will change as we as we kind of uh, develop 
uh, kind of new systems and, and ways of working. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think it's kind of developing that um, really um, going forward and actually working as a, as a full board to think about what they want as assurance at um, Quality Oversight Committee as well would be really important. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, ju just for my understanding, really, so um, uh, just in terms of the falls at St George's, St George's has probably twice, if not three times as many beds as other providers. Is that a straight falls or a percentage per bed days? Because if it's a straight falls, you probably sh would have more falls than everybody else. But just if it's a percentage of bed days, then that's a worry. So, I just need to clarify that I'm not 100% sure whether it's a straight fall or percentage per bed this. But let's find out and I will get back to you around that. Thank you. No further questions. So, is the, is the board content to note the report? Thank you. Okay, on to the next report, which is the performance report, and Jonathan Bates, our Chief Operating Officer, will talk us through the report. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, so, again, hopefully colleagues have had an opportunity to, to look at this. So, if I were to summarise it in a sentence, I think I'd say uh, the pressures are continuing to arise in the system and the performance challenges are, are, are increasing, perhaps no surprise in the context of some of the wider issues we face. but. I think uh, important to summarise that. There, there continue to be some highlights um, and some and bright spots. Um, some of them we've had for a period of time now, but I think they're wor worth mentioning and calling out to the board. So things like our dementia diagnosis rate, our learning disability health checks, all in a very good place. I'd also note the further road inroads we've made since this uh, report was produced in planned care, particularly in the long waiting patient cohorts of 78 weeks and 104 weeks where we eliminate 104 week waits and further progress in 52 week wait reductions as well. So, so a real progress at, at uh, managing care for patients and giving people timely access. Um, so uh, that remains a very strong position in comparison with the rest of the capital and nationally. Um, our challenged areas uh, well, we talked already about urgent emergency care, and you can see that writ large um, in this report, with only three quarters of people getting access uh, to care within the uh, four-hour uh, national standard, and something like 1,700 people waiting over 12 hours in an emergency department uh, for, for physical health reasons. I think there's about another 100 patients for mental health reasons uh, as well. And you can also see the challenges that we faced um, on things like 111 performance with calls abandonment rates um, and answering not being where we want them to be. And a lot of this driven by flow through the system. You can see that represented by the number of people who were in hospital for longer than they previously would have been, um, reflecting some of the acuity that colleagues have been talking uh, about earlier, but also some of the capacity issues that we, I think we face across the whole health and social care system at this point in time. So. Um, I say that's writ large and important. We did chair yeah, spend some time talking about that in the previous item, but I just, just wanted to call that out. In terms of other areas, cancer, performance, an area where normally South West London does excel, uh, we're starting to see some challenges around um, particularly achieving the 62-day standard, which is from GP referral to first definitive treatment for patients. Um, <coughs> to, to reassure the board, we have recovery plans shared with us uh, and we're working through those and reviewing those on a weekly basis to see are we moving back towards um, the trajectories we've set ourselves uh, across South West London. That feels a really important um, standard and a lot of it is actually uh, driven by good news story. The good news story being that missing treatments through the pandemic have, have largely been found as it were and have coming forward people are coming forward for treatment and that results in that's obviously a good news story for patients but does place additional pressure on the system and you can see that in a number of specialties um, at this point in time so that would probably be my second area and then the third area of challenges is, is mental health generally I think across a whole range of indicators uh, 
but Vanessa would be much more articulate in describing this than, than me, but be it inpatient settings, community settings, uh, psychotherapy settings, etc. Um, there are some the real challenges we see across workforce and capacity in every other setting equally apply to mental health, and I think that was an important area I'd want to acknowledge. So, in summary, those would be my three areas of most significant ongoing um, challenge to us. And again, there's quite a lot of detail in the report, and very happy to take any comment or question that colleagues may have. And I do, I don't know whether Mercy wants to add anything on, on this before we um, open it more widely. Just to reassure the board that we obviously have gone through um, these, these figures and particularly looking at trends and, and what's happening in the system. Thank you both. Uh, questions from the board, please. Karen. Jonathan, obviously we're concerned about the cancer um, performance, aren't we? In the, in the recovery plans that you've seen, in the trajectories that you've seen, when, what's your kind of assessment as to when that's going to come back in line? So the commitment we've made is we'll be back on target, our trajectory, um, by next March. Um, and it's different for different providers. So, so some are actually in, a, a, in an okay position, um, but some are much more challenged. Um, so uh, there are different, as I say, time frames. There's also complexity. So um, some of them are specialist national services, like the sarcoma service, which is a a particular issue at the Royal Marsden um, but a number of trusts face challenges I think we also have to link this to the overall reduction we've seen in waiting lists is good but access to diagnostic services and making sure that all the modalities of diagnostic care um, keep running at, at maximum capacity through um, the challenges we face through through this winter so um, have we in the first week or two seen a movement towards the trajectory, yes, but it is just uh, the first week or two. We need to see that progress uh, ongoing, and of course, I'll, I'll uh, happily report that back here um, uh, over the coming uh, coming months. It feels a really really important indicator, and um, uh, I think that's well recognised. And through close working with Royal Marsden Partners, who are our Cancer Alliance, they are helping us drive forward a lot of this recovery plan as well. So that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you both. Um, is the board content to note the report? Yes. Thank you. And then the final report that we have um, is from Helen Jameson, the Chief Financial Officer, who will talk us through the finance report. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so, as Gloria described around the quality report, this finance report has been developed and evolved for the board and so actually any feedback on it and anything you feel that you've is missing or you would like to be added, please do let us know because we want to enable to make sure we have the best conversations here possible. Um, so, I think it's fair to say um, the finance report is probably in two parts within this uh, report um, and it is quite complicated from that point of view, so I just thought I'd take a bit of a step back and describe the two areas. So, um, as an ICB, we get an allocation of £2.9 over a year um, to be able to support the, um, uh, the health of our population. Um, within South West London. We spend that 2.9 billion within South West London and beyond, where our population sometimes needs to have care outside of our boundaries. And so um, that's the key sort of, if you like, internal budget of the ICB, uh, the statutory body that we look at. We then have a responsibility around the whole of the NHS system in South West London, which spends around 4.7 billion. Um, that 4.7 billion includes the 2.9, but also includes income that comes into our providers from outside where they are treating populations from outside of South West London, um, whether that be in community services or in acute services or mental health services. Um, so this report is split into two parts. It looks at that internal ICB budget of the 2.9 billion as well as the 4.7 billion of the whole NHS system for South West London. Um, just to further complicate that for this year, in the first year as, as starting out on this journey, obviously um, the ICB came to be um, for, on, on the fourth month of the year. So the first three months of the year was covered by the CCG. 
So the original budget that was developed and agreed with NHS England for the 2.9 billion annual allocation was um, taken to the CCG governing body um, at that time. So when we met as a board in the 1st of July, obviously we hadn't done the accounts for that period of time. <coughs> Um, as it uh, occurs, due to timing delays, we probably we spent 10.8 million less than we expected in those first three months of the year. So in, to ensure that those 10.8 million pounds aren't lost to the system, the uh, and the financial framework was changed within the CCG so that it broke even for that period, and we're looking to move that 10.8 million pounds into the ICB budget to make sure it's still available for us this financial year. So I'm just asking the board if you'd be happy to approve that updated budget for the last nine months of the year to include that additional extra allocation so that we are, um, are working to that um, appropriate amount. If I then go on to look at the internal ICB budget um, at month five, we are showing a two million pound surplus to plan. Um, this is because we are ahead of plan due to one million pounds of um, non-recurrent savings which we have identified earlier than expected. So it's not it's just a timing issue rather than an additional amount. And because um, there is £10 million of elective recovery fund income that is sat within the ICB that due to the level of activity being delivered by our providers hasn't been earned by our providers through the cost and volume contract that we have. Um, that means that that money is still available to the system. It is quite complicated at this moment in time about elective recovery fund because NHS England is still confirming what the rules are and the guidance is to be able to allocate that out. But we want to make sure that we have that access to our system so that we don't lose those funds um, and that's why that is showing as a surplus in the ICB. Key things to note for the internal ICB budget is that continuing healthcare um, placements and prescribing remain the key risks to delivering our financial position for the <coughs> If I move on to the ICS, the wider ICS, so the NHS, um, including the NHS providers as a whole, um, you will see that they are £10 million behind, which is the equal offset for the electric recovery fund monies. Um, the key risks that remain in this for us as a system as a whole is around delivering our efficiencies. So there's a significant risk in the amount of efficiencies we need to deliver to, to meet a break-even plan, as well as having the added pressures of inflation that has come along um, and the fact that COVID, as Gloria said earlier, the, the, the amount of COVID in the system is a lot higher than was expected when we were going through the planning round. And therefore the plans that were originally done by the NHS and across the NHS didn't take that into account at the time. Um, finally, I would say that um, the capital plan is behind budget um, by about £10 million at the moment against the £128 million we have as a system, um, largely due to timings of what we're doing, etc. But at the moment, we are doing a big piece of work to review that and see what other schemes are available to us as a system. But I'm happy to take any questions or dig as Chair of Financial and Planning Committee if you'd like to add anything. Thanks very much, Helen. And um, following um, uh, Mercy's uh, example, I might just say a little bit about the Finance and Planning Committee as, as we've been developing and finding our feet as well. This report is an iteration of, of previous re re reports um, to the Finance and, um, and Planning com Committee and, and fur further refines it as the information becomes, information de develops. Just on the reprofiling point, um, that's not been to, to the Finance and Planning Committee and uh, in discussion with Helen, um, Helen suggested, but I very much endorse that it, that reprofiling should come here straight away rather than wait, wait another month. And so uh, it, it seemed to me uh, that both it's something that should be approved and that it's something that should come here swiftly. As Helen said, um, the committee's uh, challenge in, in providing useful advice to, to the board um, crosses these two different types of system, the board and the system, and, and actually decision-making within the two is, is rather different. Board, much more traditional ways in which one might address and assure and so on. The system, I, I think, raises wider challenges that, that we need to develop as a committee ourselves into addressing, which won't 
involve traditional decision making and where we have the additional pressure that of course we only exist to create changes to address inequalities and and to shift the way in which we do healthcare um, much harder so it's something that i've been e eager on the committee that we start to um, ask ourselves questions about how um, innovation and change uh, informed by finance and workforce and pl planning issues um, can help the board with change. And I'd just like to uh, add, say here that that process, of course, needs to be informed by, by us thinking in the open and engaging with as many partners as possible. We don't have a good way of doing that yet, but, but I hope that we'll, we'll be able to develop that. Uh, and that, that's worth bearing that in mind uh, as we go on with the, with the more traditional approach, uh, work of assurance and quite a lot of decision making where um, work has been done to increase the effectiveness of the assurance that can be brought to the committee uh, when we make decisions about specific expenditure. Turning to what's in this paper, um, uh, uh, for me, I'm sure not for Helen, but for me, it's been a very interesting experience seeing months sort of naught to five. It feels, uh, I never liked roller coasters, but it feels like that long, quiet descent up to the top. Um, and I think it's now, or, or maybe it's by the next board meeting, that we get the bit that everyone else seems to think is really good fun, where you go whoosh. Um, I'm not looking forward to that bit, uh, but I think we can see in the report that Helen's provided um, three key factors that, that, that really uh, speak to that. One is inflation and that very significant gap of 5% between uh, non-pay costs and the reality of inflation without even getting into some of the details about health service specific inflation. The second is workforce where, uh, as, as partners will, will know in much more deta detail, that separation, the growing gap between what would ideally be planned and the agency costs and bank costs is, is beginning to move towards something that's like when you go over the tip of that, that roller coaster. Um, and the third area uh, that Helen referred to as well is, is the £280 million pounds worth of efficiencies, where 32% of those are uh, rated red. And, and of course, those are always the hard... Transformation and change savings are always the hardest to achieve. Um, and so it's, it's a double challenge. And yet for us as a board, and those things are likely to crystallise into an adrenaline rush in the next few weeks. And yet as a board, we have to keep thinking about how we move forward and address change. And it strikes me that Helen's report very effectively shows us the scale of that challenge. And, and that's something I, I want to commend to all uh, uh, partners here. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> and Helen, can I have questions um, in terms of the finance report? James. I think it's probably less a question and more of a comment, uh, Dick, on, on your last point. So, um, you know, w when trying to transact some of that innovation and some of those efficiencies, there's a very clear link between the three. Um, the um, you know, attempting to sort of buck the trend of inflation. Um, uh, you know, one of the key ways that we do that in the NHS is through pay restraint. Well, pay restraint can, has a really significant impact on the workforce availability and drives us into temporary staffing. And actually, the inability to staff substantively and the reliance on temporary staffing then has a significant impact on our ability to deliver efficiencies because it actually constrains us in terms of the number of things we can do. So, so I think that. The, the challenge for us as a local system, for me, is, is to recognise the relationship between those three constraints. And you know, potentially it leads us some, into some slightly counterintuitive decisions for me about how we both look after our staff and also deliver efficiencies and innovation. Because I think actually, you know, I, I think the, the overall 
approach in terms of pay restraint might be giving us a bit of a false assurance that we're actually making ourselves more efficient by doing it. I think we are at risk of making ourselves less efficient. Thank you, James. Sarah. Yeah, so mine is more of a comment as well. I just think it's the board needs to be, and I know Helen has set it out in the paper, but I want to be really explicit about the level of risk that we are holding in the system at the moment, because just because we're on plan now, to be clear, our plan is that we're £55 million in deficit for, at the moment. So we are currently in a deficit position for this time of the year, because that's our plan. And the reason our plan sits at this point now is because we are going to have to make more efficiencies um, at a much higher level for the rest of the year and that is very high risk so the reason I am um, saying that is that, that looking at it now oh, we've got a balanced plan uh, yes we have got a balanced plan this this month but it's unlikely to continue that way going forward into the next six months so we just need to make sure we are acutely aware of that and as, as, as James said the only way we can make that back is by being more efficient because uh, we, we do not have the choice to not treat patients we do not have the choice to to, to not continue to see people when they come through our doors. So, ha so that is a big ask for all of the system, including our providers who are actually under a great deal of pressure at the moment. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, there may be some non-recurrent funding in the system that can cover some of that going forward for the next few months. It may or may not cover the whole of the deficit that we need to continue, but that still puts us in a worse position for next year again, because then we'll be running at a rate that we can't go afford going into next year. So I do think it's really worth the the board really understanding that and taking note of that. So I just wanted to, I know I know it's in Helen's report, but I just wanted to say it really explicitly so people understood that. Thank you, Sarah. Can I perhaps just add to that? And I, again, I think it's linking Sarah's and James's uh, comments, which is, um, and the conversation that we had about the UEC, that we have to look after our staff if we're going to be successful in achieving some of these aims. And I think we just need to recognise that difficult financial position, the need to look after our staff in this, but also drive some efficiencies through the system. That's quite difficult to achieve in the context of where we're sitting with all of the other factors swirling around. It isn't easy. It's going to involve some quite difficult decisions um, but I think it's really important that we note that and the importance in um, maintaining our workforce in order to deliver our aims. Uh, Vanessa. I think just to kind of add to it, we, we, the, whenever I talk with my staff around efficiencies they're really up for efficiencies if they can use those efficiencies to treat more patients. Their na their nature, the nature of them is if I can get more people through and treat more people I'll do it. and, and and that's really positive, isn't it? But the, the dilemma I think that we leave with our staff at the moment is they do that and, and they might not be able to provide the level of service at the level that they want to anymore. And we haven't, to be able to articulate a bronze, silver, gold level service and to release the staff from some of that pressure of actually we know you want to provide gold or platinum but actually at the moment we can own, we can't we can't we haven't got enough to be able to treat as many people that's a really mature risk conversation that i don't I'm, I'm we're having it in providers well i'm having it in my own and i know that i'm having it in there but actually how do we bring that to to this forum so otherwise we'll keep saying that we're going to drive it out through efficiencies but actually what our staff are really committed to or my staff i'll own it my staff are really committed to is treating more people that's what they want to do, um, and, and I think that's a, a real dilemma. Helen, I'll come back to you. Thank you. I, I think you know we are going to have to make some difficult choices, but it is important to support the staff and for the staff to understand exactly that, and that actually um, we need to try and support as many people as possible, and to do that, that might mean some things we might need to stop doing. Thank you. Any further questions? Jacqueline. So only I suppose this is our leadership challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, to bring all this together and lead our staff through this while supporting them, enabling them and being clear about um, what success looks like and what risk we are happy to hold both at organisation, um, place and system level because that's why the risk conversation is probably so important is that 
we're, never, we're not going to be sitting here for the next few years, I think, feeling really comfortable with the risk. And I think that's right that we don't, because it is difficult. But that is what we are here to try and do. And I think that is our challenge about how we support and protect, put an umbrella over our staff while we hold and are clear about the risk we know that they are holding and we are willing to hold with them. Thank you. Sorry, Dick. So I just wanted to come come into the. I won't uh, try and get into the finance, but the point you make, Vanessa, about about how we make that po uh, it possible to discuss different levels of risk, which obviously complements J James's point. It, it strikes me there's something quite important for us to think about as the board. How much more flexibility do we have than was? available in, in the past to try and create a little space for that, both flexibility in a formal sense of you know, what, what's allowed, but of course the, in, a, in a wider sense about what seems reasonable to people in South West London, because none of these will be easy things to do, but, but, but I'm struck that us putting together that equation and making, making judgments that feel viable to everyone who really knows the, the system. Um, and help us have a little more space to help staff feel they're moving forward and innovating positively rather than just innovating to close down must be a, a significant part of our work going forwards. Thank you. Dagmar. Yeah, and I think that's where, in a way, system and place comes in as well, because as we've said before, the worst would be that every put everybody puts their shutters down and says, I want to shed um, um, risk and pass it on. That is the worst. And um, 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 so being really transparent amongst all the partners, what their financial pressures are, what their absolutely statutory duties are, and then saying jointly, how can we get best benefit of what we have together? It, re it requires a lot of, I think, openness, so that we are not inadvertently um, um, trying to just look after our own. Thank you. Um, and I think that probably links to something that the board will need to reflect on, which is how do we do prioritisation? How do we make some prioritisation decisions, which I think, again, probably something in terms of the development of the board that we'll need to mm -hmm. reflect on and spend some time thinking about. Um, so, uh, Ben, I'm just going to check with you because I think as well as noting the paper, we've been asked to approve the ICB internal budget for months 4 to 12 and note the change in profile across quarter 1 v's quarter 2 to 4. Can I just check that we're quorate to do that? We are. Thank you. So. Uh, is the board happy to um, approve the reprofiling and note the report? Yes. Thank you. Okay, item 12 on our report. So I'd like to um, bring in uh, our Health Watch and Voluntary Sector representatives. So I think we've got Simon Breeze and Liz Meribel and give them an opportunity to ask any questions about what we've discussed today and the items on the agenda. Sorry, I need to move this a bit further, being a short person. Um, yes, I wanted to take us back first to the item on virtual awards and um, pick up a, a few issues from that. First, firstly, pick up on the point that Dagmar was making, which I thought was very important, about the public and patient engagement in relation to virtual awards, and indeed in relation to any, um, you know, changes um, in and, and innovations in service delivery, um, because the more that it is discussed with. Um, patients and other members of the public, the more likely it is that there will be buy-in and, you know, that the um, innovation will achieve its aim. And we had a, a presentation in Kingston on the virtual award scheme there, which was in, in many ways very useful and very reassuring. 
However, I think we were surprised that the scheme was only in operation from 8am in the morning to 6pm in the evening. And that did seem to leave, you know, a very long night, particularly in the winter. And, you know, pot potentially, um, you know, if we think that some of the origins of virtual wards are around managing anxiety, that did seem to be quite a period of time. Uh, for it not to be in, in operation. And I think that picks up on Mercy's point, which was that evaluation should include the impact on people who are alone at home. And uh, also at our meeting, we asked for the impact on carers to be taken into account. And I also want to pick up a point that Marion Endicott who is the patient representative at the ICS Quality Council made on the 9th of September, that the impact of the cost of living crisis on patients with long-term conditions should be uh, taken into account. And, you know, particularly with, if we're looking at reducing length of stay, there may well be an issue for quite a lot of people about the, the heating in their homes. So um, in this continuous quality improvement process, um, please could those kind of issues be fed in to the evaluation as it proceeds, because 18 months does seem, you know, quite a, a long time period. So if, if those could be fed in as it goes, that would be useful. The other point I just wanted to raise is a general one about the statement made about patient and public engagement in the cover sheets of these reports. I think it is the same statement that was used in the merged CCG and it is a fairly general statement. And I was uh, prompted to look at this in relation to the item on winter preparedness where there was an an event on the 30th of September and I was just wondering whether there was any PPE at that event but I couldn't really tell from looking at the cover sheet so perhaps if the board could give some thought about the statement about PPE actually being more tailored to that particular paper and sometimes PPE may not be needed and that would be fine but where there is some please could that be more specific Thanks. Thank you. Um, Sarah, could I ask you yeah. to come back and respond on both of those points? So I'll, I'll, there's quite a few points there. I'm going to go to some different people for some of it. One, I would say on the, um, the virtual wards, it is intended for them to be 24 hours. They're just building up to that. That's the first thing. So it's not that they will be just 12 hours. And just to be really clear, those are the, only for people being discharged from hospital under a clinician so we're not we won't be talking to the general public about it as in you can access this because people won't be able to access it in any other way other than being discharged from hospital under clinical um, under clinical supervision by by a senior clinician that's the only way people can access that so um, and and I will we will go back and ask Liz about the public and patient engagement but I do know they've got lots of positive um, feedback from the patients in it because once you're in it then that's where they get the engagement on and that will be part of the evaluation um, I think We've already covered earlier the bit around evaluating the impact on others around them and carers and so on, so we will make sure we pick that up through that process. I'm not sure what we do on cost of living, to be honest, because I think it's a problem for everyone. Um, but I'm going to come to two people. I'm going to come to Charlotte on the cover sheet and anything else she wants to mention, and Jonathan on the urgent emergency care event and who was actually at the event. Thank you, Liz. So I think we do need to make sure that patient voice and community voice is actually, you know, really part of what we do and that we hear um, patient voice and community voice uh, through all our programmes. So on the virtual ward, you know, you know HealthWatch would have been involved, but I think, I think you're right in terms of the evaluation, but also that real-time feedback. So we'll work with Martin's team to make sure we, we kind of bring that together. I think there's, there's two things really on the virtual ward. The first one is with those patients who are targeted to, to kind of receive that service. But then the, the second part of it, as Dagmar was saying, is about talking to people in the wider community and helping people feel confident about a virtual ward. Um, and we'll be, you know, we've got that in our kind of winter plan to talk to people about it. And I think actually for staff as well, 
well. I think it's good for staff to hear about the innovative things that we're doing to, to support people on the front line. So I think it's kind of, you know, double pronged really in that we're talking to people who might experience or be offered a virtual ward, but we're also talking to staff about the different ways and the innovative ways we're working. Um, so patently, we, we do need to look at the PPE <coughs> section, you know, in the papers and make sure that the decisions are informed by community voice, um, definitely. Um, and I'll let Jonathan come back on the, the winter piece. Thank you, Liz. Thanks for the question. Um, so for both events, um, we did have patient representatives there. We, we felt that patient voice was really important to have at both uh, those events. So there were a number of people at both those uh, events. I know that because I spoke to them. I can't give you everyone's name who, who was there, but we can find those out. And there were at both events, I'd say around 60 to 70 people there across the whole breadth of the system through local authority colleagues, through the whole emergency pathway from primary care, through secondary care, hospital doctors, through chief executives, chief executive of the Ambulance Trust was one of those sessions, all the chief executives of the Q Trust were at the first session, uh, so there was, there was really strong representation at, at sort of all levels across um, the system there, given the priority that we as this board have just noted and we all feel personally actually about addressing the, the issues we've got around urgent emergency care. So happy to share the names, Liz, if that would be helpful, but it, it was certainly there. Thank you. Simon, could I come to you for questions as well, please? Thank you. Uh, just one for me. Um, so it links into the, the thing about resident engagement, So and it's about the um, local place partnership boards. So I've, I've kind of raised this at a local level, but it's something that um, South West London colleagues, uh, VCS colleagues have also raised, and that's that it's very difficult for us uh, who have seats on those boards to engage and involve the wider VCS and again by, def by extension um, people they work with and represent if we can't share those papers. So I understand the, the need to not create lots of layers of meetings and bureaucracy but I think it's unrealistic to expect people at a local level to, to come to this fora to kind of find a way into what's happening with the ICB and the ICP because it's quite abstract at a local level. At this level, I think people are, are just not going to engage. So, yeah, I, I know there are some difficulties there, but I think it's something we need to kind of crack um, in order that we can kind of do, do our role. That's it. Thank you, Sarah. So, I mean, I'm happy to talk to you, and then there are place representatives here um, on, on, you know, what we can share, because we can't not share anything. Uh, there must be things that where you want to go and talk to people that can be shared. So I think it will just be about them working with you to work out what can and can't be shared, because there will be some information that, you know, if you're in, a, if you're in that kind of working group that you, you can't share externally, but there must be stuff as well that can be. And I think that James is a place represent might want to. I, I mean, I think that it's always a real challenge, Simon, with the, with the scale and complexity of the system and the number of different groups in terms of kind of trying to take everyone with us. I think that for, you know, for, for example, for, for Sutton, with myself as the ICB rep and then with Dino as the, the, uh, the ICP rep, you know, the challenge for us is to keep to continue to keep feeding into the local system. And I think it's our job then to make the link. So, you know, actually when we are, for example, talking about virtual ward, I know we've had extensive discussions about virtual ward in Sutton. So it's sort of, a, you know, try, trying to help, I suppose, everyone to kind of hold it all together and, uh, and focus on the bits which are of direct interest and relevance to them. Because there's a lot going on, isn't there? And I, and I think that's the, as we sort of evolve into this new model, I think that's the thing that we'll need to continue to work on. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, I suppose it's just building on what James is saying. So, so we are in a new model, and I think we have to make sure that both Health Watch and the voluntary sector representatives at place are equal partners. And I think that's a, a journey we need to go on. But I know the intention is there from all of the place leaders to make sure that you are sat at the table and involved. And we just need to get the processes right so that you can go out to your kind of wider constituents, if you like, and flag those issues ahead of time. Because um, I, I recognise that you don't have the infrastructure that the NHS and local authorities have. So you need time to be able to flag the issues with your colleagues and have those conversations. So I think we can have you know, conversations locally, and I know you're, you're not just talking for Sutton, you're talking for, for all of the, the places in South West London. So I think, I think we need to kind of work harder on it and make sure we get it right so that you have the, the time and, and you feel that you can make 
the comments and the contribute to the decision making in the right way. Thank you. So I think good commitment there to work with you to try to address uh, that issue. <coughs> Thank you. So, um, could I ask whether there is any other business that members of the board would like to raise? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. I nearly, I nearly got to the end. I nearly got to the end. Um, thank you. Uh, so, I think uh, that draws uh, the board to a close. We now have time for public questions. Um, so, members of the public were invited to ask questions in advance by email um, relating to the business being conducted today. There were no questions by email. Um, but I think we will now take questions from any members of the public that are present here today. And thank you for putting your hand up. If you could just introduce yourself as you ask your question. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, my name is... Okay. My first name is Rob and my surname is Rob. So, um, um, I'm a resident of the South of the Borough community for Royal Borough Kingston. I am also a member of Health Watch. I'm a member of the Chessenden District Residents Association. I'm also sit on the um, Kingston and Richmond Local Pharmaceutical Committee as a member of the public. They do allow the public there for get feedback, etc. And um, I think that's it, uh, really. Um, my first qu can I ask more than one question? Is that, is that allowed? I've got to say, I, I must commend you on your chair of this meeting. It's brilliant, thank you. Um, my first question is that, um, it's an old chestnut, as you know, is that you very qu uh, mentioned earlier that um, it, um, it's, although things are going to happen next, next April, need to be talked about now and be well underway. So therefore, you should be talking to pharmacists, pharmacists and dentists now, not waiting until next April to implement the things. Um, I believe that the Commission of Services for Pharmacy, Dentistry, Physiotherapy and Optometry, is it? Um, all run by Jeremy Woolman, one person. So you, you can talk to one person about all these services. As I go to the local um, pharmaceutical committee, I know what's going on with them, the local pharmacists. And Councillor um, mentioned about the local pharmacist's role it's very important, especially when a lot of services are being devolved to local pharmacies. But, so uh, the first point is, you should be talking to them now, and they should be included, they should be sitting around this table. But I'm, 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 I've been talking to dentists, and it's, it's an emergency with uh, NHS dentistry. The, the, the actual problem is now. And when you speak to them, the main problem is they've been waiting for the new contract for, I mean, for ages now. And um, if they knew that the new contract actually reflected um, the money, uh, when they do a, like a, a root canal, they get more money for that than they do for an oral extraction, which they don't at the moment, it's all like one, one charge. If they knew they were going to pay, be paid properly for the job, hopefully we, we can stem this, um, this, this, this migration away from uh, NHS dentistry. So you can't wait till April, as you say. You've got to start talking about things now. So my, you know, I would ask, um, um, is the new contract available for dentists? Thank you. So I think there's two questions there. Sarah, do you want to either answer them or just... Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, go, I'll give these ones a go. So welcome, thank you very much. Um, so yes, there is a plan to, uh, to move the commissioning of pharmacy, optometry and dentistry to ICBs in the future. We're just working, and, and so we are working with the teams at London. Currently it sits with... Uh, the NHS England who uh, are running from London those services so we are talking to them now and we are trying to understand what that would mean for us to have the delegation and how we would take that forward so just to give you some assurance that and we've had a sort of seminar discussion and we'll be doing a similar process to the one that we're doing on specialised with the pharmacy optometry and dentistry as well on your second point on dentistry specifically in the contract I would agree the contract is a problem. It's a national contract. We do not have control of that contract. It is a national piece of work. I was assured a few weeks ago that this was an area that they were looking at nationally and that they would be looking to have a discussion about the contract at some point in the future. But I can't give you 
any more detail than that because I just don't know, uh, Robs. But but I am sure that 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 it is an issue. I, I would agree with you. Um, but it's not something that we can solve within this ICB or any ICB. Actually, it is a national con in the same way as general practice has a national contract. So do dentists. Yeah, um, I, I just want to ensure that we ask it other, if there's any other questions, okay. if that's okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of the public? Right. Oh, thanks for that, because as you know, if you tell me where the problem lies, I will go and deal with it with, with that. So I'll yeah, do that. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the Department of Health or NHS England, no. but it's definitely national. So but I don't we, we've asked time and time again for Jeremy to come and meet us at certain local meetings, okay. and he doesn't even reply to emails. So <laughs> it's, I, know, I know it's not your problem. My second question is um, um, maybe we should change the PPE terminology because I get confused from personal protection equipment. And, uh, and um, but at the moment it stands for poor uh, patient in, um, engagement. It, it's, it's it's a disaster at the moment. Um, I sat on the first few um, Zoom meetings to setting up the ICS and I was really excited about all this going on and, the, and the bringing, back, bringing, back the, well, bringing all the services together and I thought it was a fantastic thing, the 10 year plan. But it, I soon found out that really it was a steering, it was a steering committee, it's not a consultative committee. And, and since, since then, um, uh, our PPG seem to have died. Um, um, our PCN is not a, a true PCN. Uh, we, we're, we're sort of in Chesington, and we're not, we're not actually put with the um, other Chesington practices. We're stuck with a, um, another practice on the north because um, we're owned by Churchills. They, they, the GPs have decided it's easier for them to be involved with their own sort of um, um, owner of their practice. Rather. So we need to revisit um, the whole patient participation thing get PCNs to reflect, because I think you're talking about uh, making PPGs start talking to each other, which is an excellent idea, which, you know, getting PPGs together, but we wouldn't want to be uh, included with the PCN P PPGs we've got, because they're nowhere near us, we'd like to be included in, so maybe, in that case, maybe the PPG sort of meetings, um, you, you don't do them on a, ba a PCN basis, you do them on a local basis, that, that the surgeries are incl included, that are, are, are local. Um, I mean, one of the sort of sad things about it all is the people that have antagonised patients more than anybody are GPs. With introduction of the um, online, um, um, and I'm sorry to bring him in, but I'm talking to the IT expert over here just now. He's having trouble actually getting a, an online appointment with his GP, and he's, he's an IT expert. You know, it doesn't. He hasn't really catered for the people that are um, computer uh, are not computer illiterate or literate. Sorry. Um, uh, and we've got to get back to, well, at least we had the uh, primary care CCG meetings where we could sit there and ask questions and actually get our views across. We, we, te we feel totally isolated and, and it's, it's, ur it's urgent. You've got to do something about patient p participation. You know, it, it's, uh, it's important. Thank you. Sarah. So PPGs are still a requirement of general practice. So these, these are patient participation groups that sit within general practice. So they're run by general practice. Um, and I know you're part of your local PPG and your practice should still be continuing to run that. PCNs were self-selecting. So PCNs also were self-selecting around who they worked with and the group coming together. But what I can do is I can take that back around your view of how it's currently working around your PPG and your PCN and this, this idea of having <coughs> slightly large groups. I'm happy to take that back to our local practices, our primary care teams, uh, and make sure they engage with the practices to make that as a suggestion about how you might work in the future, because I think it sounds very positive. Charlotte, did you want to say anything on that? Yeah, I suppose just to come back, that maybe we need to have another conversation, because I think that we are in a new system. Uh, we want patient and community voice to be heard, but what we haven't done is set that as a mandate from South West London and said this is how six places must engage with their local community. So we have got a bespoke engagement uh, plan for each borough uh, and we need to talk to you about that and, and check that you feel your voice is heard. So, so let's have a conversation afterwards and we can talk to the engagement lead in your place um, to make sure that that's happening. But I suppose what I would say is bear with us, you know, we are setting up new systems and processes um, and we want to get it right. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank can, can I be cheeky and ask one more question then? Because nobody else is asking. Okay, one you know, more question. Know, so, uh, ex <laughs> excellent sharing. Thanks very much. I know, you've already buttered me up. It would not have happened at the last meeting. 
Right. Uh, uh, you mentioned there's um, a capital budget, right? You, uh, can I? Um, uh, it seems we've got um, the orchard practice needs new premises somewhere. It's been on the books for years now, right? And we were top of the list at one point to be replaced. You know, a, a new replacement thing. Um, there seems to be quite a healthy amount of money in the capital budget. Um, can we ask that uh, the orchard practice is looked at again? And um, as it, as it uh, you know, it, um, I, I believe now they're not should be called practice anymore. We should have our local health centres because that's what they are now. They're not just a GP practice. Uh, they, they provide um, uh, uh, near patient testing and everything else, and they're a, a place to go for not just to see a GP, but to um, a general health problem. So, if you can spare a thought for the orchard practice in Chesterton, I very much appreciate. Thank you. I'm sure the orchard practice will be very thankful to you, Rob. <laughs> um, we do have a process around capital and uh, around how we allocate that. So, um, at primary care, there is a there is a process around primary care allocation for capital. I don't know where that is in, in, in you know we're talking about the orchard practice, and I can't answer that now. But we will come back to you on that and just work out where it is in the in the process. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for taking the time to ask your questions. So since Rob is being cheeky, perhaps I can be just cheeky as well, and, and say that actually it is true that the orchard practice was at the top of the list in, in Kingston for on, you know, uh, looking at the plan in Carey State, so, so that was indeed the case. And in relation to the PCN, um, that is an, an ongoing um, point that Rob is raising, and what we said locally at Health Watch, and I think it would apply to other boroughs as well, is that it would be great if the PCNs, as much as possible, are coterminous with the local authority subdivisions, which certainly in Kingston are called neighbourhoods, they may be elsewhere, because given the local authority role with uh, public health, having that co kind of coterminosity would really feel like you know, a real gain in terms of driving forward the public health agenda at PCN level. So, so yeah, so, so the issue that we have is that PCNs are self-selecting, it's GP practices that select it, they don't select it based on, so we cannot, um, we cannot force them to go into partnerships with, you know, with, in, in certain geographical areas, that's up to them, as long as they can evidence that they're meeting a sort of level of population, um, and that, that they can work together. That's the kind of overarching requirement around PCNs, not to be coterminous with local authority boundaries or anything else like that. Well, they have to be within a local authority, but they don't have to be coterminous with the, the boundaries within a local authority. Um, so we don't. We, there is nothing that we could do to, to kind of. Uh, I mean, it's something that if they felt would work for them and that they could work with, I'm sure it's worth a discussion with them and happy happy for my team to be involved in that, but we can't actually enforce that. Thank you. Um, so, on that note, I'm going to draw a uh, meeting to a close. Thank you very much for everybody uh, for attending and thank you to all of the teams that have put so much work into the papers. So, if people could pass on my thanks as chair. Uh, that would be uh, fantastic. Thank you.